Join our knowledgeable hosts as they dive into the captivating universe of comic books, movies, TV shows, and pop culture. Get ready for vibrant discussions and a shared enthusiasm for all things superhero and beyond. A comic podcast straight from the panels. This is Beyond the Capes. All right, everyone, welcome back to another episode of Beyond the Cape podcast. With us today is Josh O'Neill of Beehive Books. We are here to discuss their huge project that just came out, the story of Pinocchio with two very, very famous, in my in my world, two very famous uh, people kind of back in this project. Welcome to the show. Hey, Ryan. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. All right. Uh, so the first question we always ask everyone of all the professions you could choose, um, why go down the book, comic book path like the rest of us crazy people? Why that one specifically? Well, I mean, I think my answer is probably pretty similar to almost anybody you're going to ask that question, <laughs> which is just obsession with this kind of stuff. With, I mean, growing up, like books, comics, art, illustration, like all that stuff was just like a profound obsession for me since I was a little kid. Newspaper comics, superhero comics, every kind of uh, comics, films, like uh, animation um, and books, especially were very like fetish objects for me when I was a kid. I loved books, not only f for their content, but as physical objects. I yes. was like always very obsessed with them. Um, part of what I loved about comic books as a kid is like the people who published comic books took the object very seriously. Um, but I also loved uh, prose novels and uh, I loved book covers and I loved book design. And uh, I was always, you know, trying to find uh, more strange, fascinating objects that I could add to my little library, even as like, you know, an eight year old. Um, so it's just always been a world that I've been been fascinated by and a little bit obsessed with. Um, so I sort of, you know, stumbled down this path, just following things that I that I really love and I'm interested in. Um, and, you know, I'm lucky enough, I've gotten to work with uh, a lot of great people and uh, including some people who I yeah, who I grew up reading, um, which is a genuine privilege and thrill. Um, so yeah, I feel very lucky. I get to I get to work with stuff I love every day. Yeah, no, I mean, and you're not alone. Um, my wife can attest that she I was the only person she ever met. Uh, my goal is to have a house with a library. I think that's very important. Uh, she also had no idea why I paid so much money for a copy of Fahrenheit 451 that had the match tucked in the spine with the little cinder that goes along it to burn the book. That was like the yeah. best thing I've ever owned in my life. That's uh, wait. So what edition was that? I can't even remember. Um, I just know that I saw a picture of it once, and I it's went like hunting. A special edition that came with like a match, like the match, the book. The match was tucked like into the bound spine, and then along the spine was like the little, um, little like cinder spot. Oh my god! I love that. I yes. love that. I yes. love Raspberry too. I'm a huge fan. So that's that's now something which I'm going to be looking for. There's exactly. uh, I have an amazing was it Polio? I forget who published it, but I have an edition of Fahrenheit 451 that has like a heat sensitive cover. So the cover looks completely black, like it doesn't have any type or anything. But if you put a lighter to it, like it reveals like the the cover typography. <laughs> it's really no, cool. It's yes, best thing. Books are the best thing ever. Um, so obviously you had a huge background growing up as a kid um, and you had a lot of exposure. It sounds like to quite a few different um, areas of literature. At what point as growing up that you finally kind of decide like this is what I would like to pursue and I really want to start getting on track to making this kind of my profession or my livelihood? Well, I sort of stumbled into what my actual, I mean, I'm, you know, I'm a book publisher, uh, which is, I've heard described as an accidental profession. Like nobody as a little kid is like, I want to be a book publisher one day. Um, at, when I was young, I really wanted to be a writer. I am kind of a writer. I, I, I am not a professional writer most times, but I do a lot of writing on the side. And sometimes I do a little, you know, journalism or criticism and I write comics also. Um, 
but I got into all this through writing. Um, and I, I moved to uh, Philadelphia. I went to college here and I studied writing. Um, and I got involved with the sort of collective of artists and writers and cartoonists here, different people working on making comics. Um, and that sort of grew into this thing, which was called Locust Moon, uh, which was like a Philadelphia based comics collective. We eventually opened a comic shop in Philly. So that's kind of how I got into the comics world was working in and eventually opening uh, my own uh, comic book store with some partners. Um, and we started publishing books through the store, kind of as like a little sideline thing. Uh, we did like a quarterly magazine and we did some anthologies, a lot of which were just these like collective projects of people living in Philly, working on comics, trying to, you know, like we were all trying to figure out uh, what directions our careers yeah. were. Going. So it's like, you know, you all get together and everybody does a story and then you publish a book. Um, so that's kind of how I got into it uh, initially. And I, I ran that store uh, with my partners for almost eight years. Um, and we published a lot of books uh, over that time, but it was really, the publishing was kind of a sideline to the retail uh, side of things. But I really fell in love with book publishing. Uh, I got so fascinated by the process of it. And I love working with all these different artists and I love the challenge of it. And I loved just thinking through the project from, from uh, you know, the material level to the editorial level, to the conceptual level, and, and working with all these wonderful people and thinking about design and thinking there's so many pieces, thinking about marketing, um, all these different things that go into the making of a book. The whole process is kind of still fascinating to me um, and is it's very it's a very various process. You work yeah. on a lot of different things in the process of making a book. Um, so uh, we did a book. Uh, I had this idea to do a tribute to Little Nemo and Slumberland. I'm assuming you know Little Nemo, <laughs> and most of your most of your listeners do. Um, for anybody who don't who who doesn't know Little Nemo, is one of the first great masterpieces of the comics medium. It's by Windsor McKay. It started in 1905. Um, it was a Sunday newspaper strip uh, where each strip was like a dream that this little kid Nemo would have. And they were incredibly sort of Baroque, almost proto psychedelic illustrations uh, of these crazy dream sequences on this huge full page broadsheet newspaper page. It's like 16 by 21 inches. Um, and so we had this idea to do a tribute uh, where we got contemporary artists to do their own versions of a Little Nemo strip. Um, and we wanted to publish it at the full size of those original strips, which is Definitely. like this kind of a surfboard. It's like a massive. <laughs> yes. um, so we did this amazing project where, you know, I just started reaching out to all my favorite artists. And I had very little experience in publishing at this point. We had published a handful of things. Um, but I started reaching out to, you know, everybody who I loved who was doing comics. Uh, and because of the Windsor McKay factor and the idea of getting to pay tribute to Little Nemo, a huge amount of them said yes. And before we knew it, we had like 120 some artists in this book, a lot of whom were people who I, you know, thought were geniuses beyond compare and had grown up reading. And um, so we did this book uh, that was kind of a, a big success. Uh, it won a, a couple of Eisner Awards and Harvey Awards, and it got a lot of good reviews, and it sold a lot of copies. And it was this crazy idea. It was this gigantic, oversized book. It had all these people in it. It uh, was very ambitious. And so that kind of became the seed for what I wanted to do with Beehive. Uh, we ended up closing our store in 2016, and that's when uh, I started Beehive Books. I brought on a partner, uh, Mael Delavo, who is an artist and, and designer. Um, and we founded Beehive together, sort of all, based on the idea that you can do stuff that's a, a little bit crazy, doesn't really naturally fit into normal marketing channels or book trade channels, stuff that's off the beaten track. And that can kind of become the brand that ev everything you do is a little odd, a little bit off, uh, a, a little bit crazy. Um, 
and often formally ambitious in some way, weird sizes, weird shapes, uh, uh, interesting production techniques, unusual materials, like all that kind of stuff is hallmarks of what we do uh, at Beehive. Uh, so anyway, that's a long uh, answer to your question, but that's no. kind of how I stumbled into this work. <laughs> I mean, that's the answer. And, and that's kind of why we're here today that we'll discuss later is you have your hands on a very interesting uh, project that we'll get to uh, now, when you started this company and you've had obviously experience putting these books together, um, and you, you kind of have a little bit of publishing under your belt now, um, what made you just, what, how, did you just get thrusted into the editor position or was that just kind of the known, like when we start this company, you would kind of take point on that? Yeah. I mean, when I initially started the company, I, I was starting it on my own. I, I brought my L on like pretty quickly and partnered, uh, but in the beginning, I was just founding my own company. Um, so I was kind of doing everything that I had the capacity to do. There's a lot of skill sets that I just like absolutely don't have. So I'm not going to be, you know, the one doing illustrations or designing the books or um, but anything that I could do. And I did have a fair amount of editorial experience. Yeah. Uh, I had worked as an editor, uh, you know, for different clients over the years. And I had edited a lot of the, the books uh, that we did with Locust Moon. Um, so that was something I had like a fair amount of experience with. So it was just kind of natural that I would sort of do the more editing publishing side. And Mael, who is an artist and designer, handled more of the design and production side of things. Um, so that was like a natural, a natural split for us uh, in terms of whose skills kind of lie where. I was more at the word person and she was more the picture person. I mean, and that works out um, having uh, just like any writer or artist when you're making a comic book or even just a book in general um, is having that partner and knowing each other's strengths and weaknesses. Uh, that always seems to make a stronger, I mean, I think a stronger book and it makes a stronger comic book. Um, now for everyone listening and we talked a little bit about the show, I'm very excited to have an editor on the show. Uh, because I, time anybody's ever said that <laughs> I've, I've never had the opportunity i've reached out to a lot of them and i think they think that's a joke uh when i say like <laughs> could you please could you come on the show because i re i really yeah. don't know what an editor does especially in the comic book or even the book uh of this like what's a day-to-day -day? like what are what is the editor like what's their main focus what what are their daily tasks well, I mean, you know, Beehive is a very small company. Uh, we have just a handful of people working here. So I don't know that I am a prototypical editor because like most of my day is not spent doing editorial tasks. Ed editing is one out of, you know, 15 things that I have my, my hands on every day. But it is something that I have a really deep love of. And one of the you know, a, a lot of what I do at Beehive, I feel like I don't actually have any natural talent for but i'm just trying to keep the wheels turning so i've sort of learned how to do a lot of things which i maybe have you know i, I don't have a natural uh, inclination towards them i think you know editing and writing are things that i do have a bit of a natural inclination towards they're things I've, I've i've loved my whole life um and a lot of you know we work with such great authors and artists at beehive uh often uh, there's not a lot of like really heavy hands-on uh, editing because so much of what people to deliver to us is already absolutely brilliant. Um, but one of the things I really love is just trying to find people to work with who are, who you really think are brilliant uh, and just trying to put them in the best possible position uh, to do what they do and make sure they feel the freedom that we want them to feel to kind of explore their own uh, um, their own vision for whatever the project they're trying to do is. So a lot of times what I'm trying to do as an editor is just listen to what an author or what an artist is trying to achieve and try to see if there are some areas where I can help guide them gently towards achieving that with greater clarity or uh, your role as an editor is really very similar to your role as a reader. You're just there to listen and pay attention and kind of give somebody your really authentic reaction uh, to what you're reading. Um, so a, a lot of it is like 
functional, keeping the trains running yeah. on time, keeping your hands on all the different parts of a project, making sure that everybody has all the information they need. Uh, a lot of the parts of the job are just logistical. Uh, the creative parts of the job are uh, the most fun parts for me. Um, and getting to work with, you know, authors like Lemony Snicket and Mike Mignola is just an, an absolute joy. And if, if I can help them uh, in any way at all, make their already fantastic, brilliant work like 0.1% better, I mean, I consider that in a home run of a day. Definitely. Um, now, as an editor, if would you say if you had to make like a heart, like I, we need like if you got a writing script, you would maybe say like, I really want like this sentence changed or is it still more of just a guiding like, hey, this sentence kind of sticks out in the story. Is there a way we can work? Um, is there, a, I guess, is there a difference between the two or is it more you kind of just want to point out to the writer that this is maybe confusing or could be clarified and let them kind of fix it? It really, it's wildly different from project to project. It depends very much on the author and what they're looking for. Um, I mean, I've worked with authors that love like intense line editing and I love to do intense line editing if it's if it's what's right for the project. Um, but there are other authors who absolutely don't want that and want big picture feedback and you kind of guide them in a, in a general direction. Um, so there's really no one size fits all uh, editing approach. It's, it, it, you know, and also like what we do with Beehive is so various, you know, sometimes yeah. we do graphic novels and we do historical monographs and we do illustrated versions of fiction and we do uh, like an annual art magazine and all, all these different things have totally different uh, editorial approaches that, you know, they can be totally hands off or they can be like really, really, you know, under the car, like turning the screws um, and anything in between. Uh, so it really does, does vary quite a lot. All right. Um, now for we, and we have a lot of uh, listeners and people that follow us that are current writers um, kind of in their own indie either indie book, indie graphic novel, or indie comic scene, if you had to give maybe one piece of advice that you've seen from your time being an editor that you think would help a writer either while they're writing the story or even just editing maybe their own before they submit something, do you have something you'd like to say like, hey, this is one thing that I am surprised that gets missed a lot. This is something you should kind of take a look at. If, it's, if we're talking about a comic writer who is writing a script... Uh, by far the biggest piece of feedback I give <laughs> is less words, like way less words. Like everybody yeah. uses too many. Cartoonists don't have this problem in my experience. If you are, if you have a, an author artist who is drawing and writing their own work, they don't usually fill it with text, <laughs> but so many comics writers, including some incredibly talented ones, it always gets better when you cut out half of the dialogue <laughs> in my experience. Yeah. So that's uh, always, always my, and I think that that advice often works for prose writers too. It's, yeah. Yeah. Almost everything gets better when you make it shorter. I mean, that's not always true. There, there is, uh, there's definitely no, no one size fits all advice, but you're rarely going to go wrong by saying, you know, like cut 30% of what's here. Uh, and it's funny you say that because uh, I think two of the past indie creators that we've had on for their first comic book, they said, you know, the hardest thing was, turning a 60 page manuscript of my complete story and trying to shrink it down to about maybe 18 pages uh, with about like 16 panels at most with dialogue. Um, so yes, that is, that is something I've heard a lot that they had to learn the hard way because no one did tell them, <laughs> uh, be careful yeah, how it, much you're writing. <laughs> yeah, ab absolutely. Like comics are such an economical medium like you don't have a lot of space to you you really have to get in and get out um but yeah i always feel, I, I also feel like a really good advice for uh writers who are not artists is draw thumbnails of every comic you write it, and no matter how horrible they are no matter how ugly they are uh even if you don't ever want to show them to anyone i mean when i write comics i i mean i, I can't draw to save my life but I draw thumbnails of everything and then I throw them away when I'm done and I don't show them to anyone. I'm only doing it because 
I need to know how much space there is on the page. Yeah. And I need to know that what I'm describing is literally possible to draw at all. Um, Cause half the time you write a panel and then you sit down and try to thumbnail it. And you're like, this is impossible. <laughs> like this doesn't make any sense. And there's no real way to know that uh, unless you have like a perfect visual imagination, which most people don't. I mean, maybe some people do, but the people who do are probably artists already. Um, so uh, it really helps when you sit down and actually try to lay out the page, including all the dialogue that you're writing, write that into the thumbnails and like see how it looks on the page. And half the time it looks ridiculous and you have to rewrite the page. Definitely. No, that's a great point. Uh, and for everyone listening, you should definitely take that planning is everything. <laughs> no matter what you're doing in literature, planning is <laughs> so key. Uh, which brings I know, it brings us to a, the whole reason we're here. Um, and that is taking a literary classic that almost everyone knows, uh, Pinocchio, and giving it that modern twist with two very amazing people. Mike Mignola, obviously we all know Hellboy is... That's just a character that just stands out no matter... You could pick him out almost from a crowd. Um, and then what I was very excited to see was Lemony Snicket because a series of unfortunate events was a book series that I would have never... It seemed so simple from the back, but what he what they did was so profound in the story. Um, it was crazy. How did, we, how did we get into this project? How did we select, I mean, like this story? Well... I mean, Mike Mignola and Lemony Snicket really, they feel like they should be together somehow. You know, yeah, I, they've yeah, never worked yeah, together definitely. before. It's just like chocolate and peanut butter. It just yeah. feels like such a natural meeting of two of these massive talents uh, who are such world builders. Uh, but so the way we got into this is, so we have a series. It's an ongoing imprint called Illuminated Editions uh, in which we take different pieces of classic fiction and have different artists uh, do new illustrations for them. And we publish them in these uh, big oversized uh, hardcover slipcase editions. So we've done, uh, I think Pinocchio was the 10th. We have the 11th coming out now. So we've done uh, 10 books in this series so far. And it's ongoing. We do about two a year. Um, and it's very artist driven. Uh, the way we we had this idea for this as like an ongoing thing. It's one of the first things we did with Beehive. I mean, we launched uh, Beehive in 2016 and the first book came out in 2017, I think. Um, so Myel and I just made a list of artists we would want to work with on yeah. a series like this. Uh, and we reached out to a whole bunch of different people who we thought could do something brilliant. Um, and we started conversations with them and uh, Mike Mignola was on that very short list of, of people. Um, and uh, we really, we approach it as a sort of artist first uh, project. Like we reach out to the artist and then we start a conversation with them about what book they would want to illustrate um, as opposed to starting with the book and then trying to find the right illustrator for it. Um, so we started off, we had uh, Yuko Shimizu and Bill Sienkiewicz and Paul Pope were our first three creators. Uh, uh, Yuko did the fairy tales of Oscar Wilde. Bill Sienkiewicz did the Island of Dr. Moreau. Mm -hmm. Paul Pope did Algernon Blackwood, the Willows and some other short stories. Um, and so we just started a dialogue about what would be an interesting book to illustrate. Mike was one of the first people we reached out to. And he immediately said, man, I've always wanted to, to draw Pinocchio. Um, and then we talked to Mike about this for years. We were never really able to get it on the schedule. Mike obviously is incredibly busy with a thousand different projects from, yeah. you know, books to films to things he's writing to things he's drawing to uh, it, Mike's always, you know, doing a million amazing things. Um so we never were quite able to get it onto the schedule. I think Mike also had some anxiety about drawing Pinocchio because he has <laughs> such reverence for it. Yeah. A, and he really grew up like loving it and being obsessed with it with his brothers. Um, so it was something really special to him. Um, and uh, it was really, uh, it was really the pandemic uh, where it actually got started. 
because we had gone back and forth, you know, every six months, we would have a little exchange with Mike where he would say, I really want to do this. I'm busy right now. Maybe we can do it beginning of next year. And, uh, and then finally, you know, it was a dark time and everybody was trapped inside their house unless they were a frontline worker. And I think we got an email from Mike that said, you know what, like I'm, I'm stuck in my house. I have nothing to do. I think I'm ready to draw this project. Um, and it was kind of an amazing experience. You know, it was a great distraction during, during such a weird time of those early days of lockdown uh, that, uh, you know, Mike was producing these incredible illustrations on like a daily basis. He did, you know, over 50 illustrations uh, of this book. And I think it only, he only worked on it for about three or four months or something like that. Um, but it was, he was really in Pinocchio. He was like working so hard on this. He was producing so much gorgeous stuff. And every day or two, you would open your email and there would be some majestic thing. Uh, it was just such a joy. And so for each of these projects, uh, we uh, will usually have some author or filmmaker or critic uh, or academic write an introduction to the book that we hope shed some new light on the text and sometimes comments on the uh, on the artist's uh, interaction with the text. Um, and we've had some really great people. Uh, we've had like Guillermo del Toro, you know, who's Mike's old uh, collaborator on the Hellboy films, uh, wrote one for us. We've had Alan Moore and a ton of other great, great authors. Uh, and so we often brainstorm like who would be the perfect person. The first person we thought about was uh, was Lemony Snicket. Um, and we reached out to him. We just sent a cold email, I think, to uh, his agent. Um, and we got an email back from him uh, saying, I love Pinocchio. Uh, I don't want to write an introduction for it, but I have another idea for something I would like to do. Um, which was so much more interesting and fascinating than uh, than the idea that we had pitched him, which was just you know a straightforward little introductory essay. He said, "I I want to document my encounter as Lemony Snicket with this text as a full text annotation." Um, and the concept behind it is that Pinocchio is such a strange and mind-boggling piece of writing that Lemony Snicket will slowly be driven insane by this process of encountering <laughs> this text, almost as though it's this Lovecraftian thing where the human mind cannot really comprehend <laughs> the work that Collodi is doing. Um, and we said, oh my God, okay, <laughs> sounds amazing. It's so outside of anything we had done with Illuminated Editions before. It really expanded our idea of what we can do with this series. Um, and then based on that idea, we sort of came up with this concept uh, to present them, not just as footnotes, but as these hand typed little inserted pages. So each page, each chapter of the book has a little slipped in type sheet, which Lemony Snicket hand typed there in his study as he's slowly losing his mind as he's reading through the story of Pinocchio. So, you know, in the beginning, they're sort of neatly typed. By the end, the pages are covered with coffee stains and revisions. And, you know, from when he passed out and his head landed on the typewriter, there's, uh, you know, 27 letters in a row that make no sense. Um, so it becomes almost this concrete poetry, this weird, uh, it's this second story layer that exists on top of the novel. Then you're holding these little two-sided two type sheets in your hand as Lemony Snicket is sort of leaning over your shoulder and potentially drooling on the pages as he's losing his mind. Um, so it became this really weird metafictional uh, kind of thing. Um, and what we really wanted to do is draw attention ultimately to the original text, or in this case, the wonderful translation by Carol Della Chiesa of the original Italian text um, of Pinocchio, which considering that Pinocchio is probably one of the most uh, read books in the history of the world, it's certainly one yeah. of the best known books in the history of the world. I think it's been translated 
into more languages than any book besides the Bible is something that I read somewhere. I've never fact checked that, but it is something that I've heard. Uh, in some ways, the actual text, the prose story of Pinocchio gets a little bit lost in the face yeah. of all the hundred million adaptations of it in the face of, uh, of the Disneyfication of it, which really, yeah. I love the Disney Pinocchio film. I really think it's one of the great animated American films, but it is wildly different uh, yes. from the book <laughs> and loses a lot of the incredible strangeness and darkness of the book, which is really anarchic and violent and yeah. odd <laughs> and fascinating. And, um, and you sort of can't, when you read it, you're like, what am I reading? What is this? This is so strange. Um, and it's such a wild ride of an experience, especially for somebody who thinks they already know Pinocchio, um, because you think you kind of know what you're getting into. And then you start to dig into it and you rapidly realize this is something else. This is something really, really different. Um, and so for all these, you know, brilliant uh, people we have involved, uh, I mean, Dave Stewart also doing the colors on, on Mike's uh, illustrations, you know, one of the great comics colorists of all time. A, a big part of the purpose of this project is really just to shine a light on the text and bring people back to the incredible Baroque strangeness and weirdness of it. Um, so that's been one of the real joys of, of the project is uh, um, trying to get people to actually read the book uh, because it's it's a unique experience. No, I think that's correct. Uh, I was because I was very excited when I had heard the email announcing this. And I said, no, they they must be doing like the Disney Pinocchio, which, yeah, I, I agree. It's something I grew up as a kid watching. Uh, but I did go back and read the book and man was the. The darkness in that story, uh, huge. Um, well, so. when when the first appearance of the character who is Jiminy Cricket in the films is just called the talking cricket in the books, when he first appears in like chapter three or four, um, you're like, oh, okay, the cricket is here. Uh, and then Pinocchio immediately grabs a hammer and kills him <laughs> within like yeah. four paragraphs. You're like, okay, this is different. This is different than the Disney version. He did not murder Jiminy Cricket no. in the Disney version. Um, so yeah, you know you're in for uh, in for a bit of a wild ride. Yeah, uh, which was great because then that's when I when I was reading the paragraph like summing it up. I'm like, all right, so they're taking the actual story, and then when I saw the name. Uh, Mike Mignola, like, oh my God, this is why is Pinocchio not? He should have been in Hellboy too, in the city uh, for all like the lost, all lost creatures, because this pairs up so perfectly with his stylized drawing uh, to this story. Uh, Absolutely, it could not be a better fit, and I think it was a big influence on Mike's whole aesthetic. I mean, he grew up loving that book, and I think his. His brothers also loved it. Mike's brother wrote a, uh, he wrote like a sequel to Pinocchio at some point that Mike drew a cover for. Um, so this is uh, Mike's second time uh, drawing a Pinocchio illustration. Um, so yeah, it's just something that I think is part of his creative DNA. Uh, so I just think it was, it, you couldn't imagine a better, a better marriage of a text with an author. Oh, for sure. Um, now with this project, um, you have a, very classic story that's already pretty much laid out. You got a great artist. You have a great writer kind of putting this almost his second story within the story. Was there any challenges that came with it? Because this seems like one of those projects that's more of just sit back in my seat and just watch the ride because everyone is so great. It's just really just watching the parts come together. Yeah, I mean, uh, there wasn't, uh, I didn't have to do a lot of editing on this project, honestly. I mean, I did give feedback on everything and my, my biggest piece of feedback for lemony snicket was just like to lean into the weirdness of of what he's doing and in yeah. terms of that second layer of storytelling um and i think our biggest contribution was the the concept of turning it into these actual slipped in type sheets uh which i think uh lemony snicket probably would have loved to do 
but didn't even bother to suggest because he assumed it was something no publisher would ever do. Um, and we suggested it to him and uh, um, he got so excited about it. And I just think it was such a good fit for the whole strange uh, tactile nature of this, of this bizarre tome uh, uh, that, that we made together. And that, you know, our, our biggest challenges were uh, a lot of production challenges in terms of, figuring out how to make that work, how to make the type sheets work. I mean, Mael actually, I mean, to, uh, you know, break the fiction of it a little, she typed those type sheets on her own typewriter. Um, uh, many of which she actually typed, she was driving cross country uh, while we were finishing this project. So she was, you know, like typing uh, these, <laughs> these pages from like a motel room in uh, Arkansas. <laughs> um, and trying to get those just right, trying to get the materials just right. So they really felt like type sheets, uh, um, all the, the the production details of the aging of the page, like it, it all has to feel real. Um, so there were a lot of challenges involved with that. There were a lot of delays because of some of those challenges. The book came out almost eight months after we originally planned it to come out. Um, but it was all, uh, it, it was worth it. And it was a genuine, just, just, it was a thrill ride getting to do this thing. And I'm so happy with how it turned out. And I think everyone involved is. Definitely. Um, and speaking of the type sheets um, and that you guys are so unique with your publishing and putting stuff together, was it hard to put to together the design of this book? Because immediately comes to my hand, I picture like a disheveled typewriter page on like a leather bound book uh, almost like a distressed leather with like, like a classic Pinocchio lettering or was, did you kind of have to really think like, man, how, how do we frame such a story? Well, so we, we have a sort of design sensibility uh, that comes with our illuminated edition series. Like there are certain okay. things that are all that are standardized, these sort of chapter headers that we use and uh, the sort of trade dress of the, of the book and the, the fact that they all come in these slip cases that are embossed and debossed to create this kind of sculptural effect. Um, so uh, so the, there's a sort of three layer thing. You're, you're, you're trying to come up with a, with a sensibility for each individual book and it's got to fit the the text and it's got to fit the artist's illustrations and it's got to fit the illuminated edition series uh so it's a matter of sort of triangulating between those three aesthetics and trying to find some sweet spot where where they all sort of meld into one beautiful uh thing and that's my l my l uh you know has designed uh this entire series uh, some of the forthcoming titles we have some other designers uh, working on since we're trying to expand it a bit, but uh, but uh, up to this point, Mael has designed all of them, and she's just an incredible book designer, just brilliant beyond compare. Um, and uh, part of the fun of it was the you know for the first time we had this second layer where we have these slipped in type sheets. Yeah. So it allowed us to introduce like a whole different universe that didn't fit in with our kind of, you know, a part of what we do with illuminated editions is we're trying to take these, you know, classic stories, but give them like an updated uh, design sensibility. We're not doing antiquarian design. We're not yeah. doing a leather bound tome. They're, they kind of look almost a little futuristic. Um, they're, they have like a very clean, gorgeous kind of, uh, almost a sleek design sensibility um, and incre also incredibly detailed, incredibly decorative, incredibly full of illustration. Uh, but we're trying to make books that are really for the future. We're trying to make books that will look contemporary 50 years from now. Yeah. Um, but then we also have this Snicket aesthetic that is a sort of more Victorian kind of uh, aesthetic so it allowed us to have this fun collision of things where you have this this book that feels extremely modern in a lot of ways and then you have these aged type sheets that are like slipped in um so it feels like these these two different time periods different design aesthetics that are kind of crashing together um in this way that creates this like really unique and unusual uh, effect. So that was a really fun thing for us to explore in terms of 
uh, design storytelling, which is something that we just like absolutely love to do uh, at Beehive. And uh, Mayel really took to the the task, and I think she really uh, she achieved it so brilliantly. Awesome. Uh, and then we'll do one final question before we start getting the information on where we can get this book. Um, and I usually try to ask one, one fun question to kind of round off um, our talk here. Um, you obviously, again, have a lot of background in stories, uh, books, li- short stories. Do you have one in your personal collection that maybe you're not going to do yet for your publishing company that you would love to see to get an artist and a writer to illuminate this story f- for your own, almost your own personal satisfaction? Oh my God, I have so <laughs> many. It's such a hard question to answer because I literally like have a list of like 50 things I could rattle off. Um, there's uh, one I would, I would really love to do some Kafka short stories. That's one that I would absolutely love to do. I would say there are two types of, uh, of books that I'm drawn to for illuminated editions. And they're sort of in two opposite categories in some ways. They're either books that are extremely visual in their nature and that yeah. give an artist like a lot to play with. Obviously, like I'd love to do Lord of the Rings. Like that would yeah. be like, and it's been illustrated to death, but I would love to try to find some new tone in Lord of the Rings. Uh, I think there's a lot of interesting things you could do. Uh, the Wizard of Oz, you know, things that are hyper visual and like the challenge is finding something new and exciting to do with them. But then there are also books that are very cerebral and not very visual. And to me, like half the fun is like trying to find some visual way into them that illuminates something really interesting about them. So that would be like Kafka or like Samuel Beckett, I would really love to uh, to illustrate, or James Joyce, like they're, they're yeah. writers that are not in their fundamental nature, like they're cerebral writers, they're, their work is extremely prose, you know, it's not, um, it doesn't give you obvious visual cues. And that's in a lot of ways even more fun, uh, because you get to invent something totally, I mean, the, the, the artist gets to invent something totally new, and it's very important to us that these, we're not really interested in like visual depictions of stories. We're more interested in like conceptual approaches, yeah. to creating something that's like a visual portfolio that kind of collides with the text and like creates something, some electricity that like the reader can take. Um, that's what's always the most fun to me. I mean, when we had Brecht Evans illustrate Peter Pan for us, he literally did not illustrate anything that happens in the book. Peter does not appear in his illustrations anywhere. Um, he illustrated other things from uh, Neverland that are never described. And, you know, in Peter Pan, uh, which is another brilliant children's book that I think not enough people actually read the book. Um, and it's so much weirder than people realize. Yep. Um, it's full of, you know, the author saying, I'm not going to tell you about X, Y, Z. And there's this other thing that happened, but we don't have time to talk about that. So he took this approach where he's just drawing other things and they kind of like lead you off in these other directions. Um, so anyway, that was a non-answer to your question because I can't no. name thing. But uh, there's so many things that are, that are so much fun to do and so many you know plans and schemes that we have. Um, but uh, yeah, it's just it's just such a privilege to get to work with these these great books and to get to work with these great authors who are so excited about them. Um, that's one of the most fun things uh, when your collaborators are so charged up when you can feel their energy and it gets you excited. Definitely. Well, we're very excited. It sounds amazing. Like I said, this is a great story for anyone that has never read Pinocchio. This is your chance to, this might be, be one of the better additions to dive in because you get such a sort of almost a visceral like look at Pinocchio along with the story. And now you're also, you're almost getting two stories for one as you watch someone descend into madness from, from the story that you're reading. Uh, so we, well, we I have find, this- yep. oh, I'm sorry, go on. No, you're good. Oh, I was just gonna say, I find when you read Pinocchio, you, there's a feeling you kind of want to turn to someone next to you and go like, this is <laughs> great. Like, are you reading? Like, this is nuts. Like, did you see what just happened? And so, like, I feel like what Lemony Snicket did was 
provide that person. <laughs> like there is another person alongside you going like, yeah, I see it too. It's not just you. <laughs> you got a friend with you on this one. Yes. Um, so the book came out August 27th. Um, so it's it's out everywhere. Where are the best places to go and find this book for anyone interested? Uh, you can order it directly at beehivebooks.com. Uh, you can also uh, find it anywhere books are sold. It can be ordered at any bookstore. Some libraries have it. Um, yeah, encourage your local independent bookstore uh, to order it. You can get it on Amazon if you want to. I hate Amazon, but like, <laughs> they, they will they will get you a copy of the book very quickly. Um, and uh, yeah, so it's it's pretty it's pretty readily available. It's out there. Um, and we're going to be doing a book launch event on November 8th uh, with with Mike in uh, Los Angeles, which actually has not been officially announced yet, but will be announced very soon. Awesome. Well, we look forward to that. And for everyone interested to keep up to date with what you guys are doing, where is the best place to follow you guys? Um, either at beehivebooks.com. You can follow us on social media. Uh, Instagram is at beehivebooks. Uh, Twitter is at beehivebks. Um, or really the best way is our email mailing list. We keep that pretty well updated. Uh, so just send an email to info at beehivebooks.com asking to be added to our email list and you'll get all the info you need about any of our forthcoming projects. Awesome. Well, we can't wait to see what you guys put on the future. Everyone listening, Pinocchio, the illuminated edition by beehive books, go get it now. Um, and, Hope you enjoyed this episode and we hopefully look forward to having you guys back on as you release more stuff. Thank you so much for having me, Ryan. It's really a pleasure to talk to you. No problem. Thanks for coming on. Everyone listening, we hope you had fun. Follow Beehive Books. And if you like this episode, follow us on Instagram, YouTube, um, and wherever else you uh, have your socials. Everyone, have a good night.